and giving me the opportunity to here to be here and to talk. I also like to thank Vitrolife and. I have one disclosure slide which I need to show you because I have a consultancy company and part of that is also on consultancy on time lapse. I'd like to start with you with this overview slide, which I would say illustrates a little bit like a dream. I mean, I started in cell culture work in something like 1980 something, and I was working with Xenopus Levis embryos, and I was really excited as soon as I got any possibility to look on these embryos in time lapse, which was very easy because it was animal experimentation. But when I later started and moved into the IVF field, I realized, man, it's really good if you could have the same technology over there. And that was a dream, and this dream more or less was about having a continuous observation, always being able to look at the embryo knowing exactly what the embryo does in terms of morphology, in terms of cleavage patterns, in terms of how the morphology changes over time. And being able by that to use this whole information we get in order to select and deselect. And I think it was very exciting because as David told, in around 2008, 2009, this dream came true. And we got these systems in the market, we got them commercially available and we could start to work on them. And I think what I like to give you in my talk is the overview about the top part here, because the bottom part, which is also an aspect of time lapse, which is undisturbed culture, optimized culture conditions, that will be taken over, especially by Marius and by Steve Troop in their talks. My aim is a little bit to guide you and really show you that we are at the moment there to have this dream coming true, where we say, yeah, we can get better pregnancy rates, we can get higher implantation rates, we really can use that. We get lower pregnancy loss, and by that, all of a sudden, we most probably get a shorter time to pregnancy, which is quite interesting for our patients. Now, why use time as an IVF? This is an overview of, of some of the key factors, I would say, we should talk about and we will talk about in this one hour here we are together. So we'll talk about the observational dilemma, about embryo information, about undisturbed culture, all that which is in order to improve outcomes. And later on, we will go into these additional benefits for the clinics. Let me start with, with that one. This is what all of us as embryologists maybe face as a problem. We want to have as much knowledge as we can about our embryos. And I mean, it's, it's always a, a tragedy when you know, yeah, we are now sticking the embryo incubator and I can't look at them. I want to know what they are doing. The only option we had for a long time is taking them out putting them out of the incubator, out of the culture conditions, looking at them. We get more information, but at the same time we disturb them. Disturbance always means that logically we will we'll have any impact, we have an impact on the culture. Time-lapse actually provides the solution because we have a continuous observation possibility. We can always look at the pictures. Even at night, if you're at home, you can remotely look on and you look on the pictures. You can have this undisturbed culture. You have this absolute strict environmental control. And I think this really is one of the main issues we are talking about. We get more inferior information. We have dynamic morphology. That means we can look on the changes of, the, of, of morphology over time. We can look on cleavage patterns because for the first time we can look on cell cycles and we can detect cleavage patterns we never saw before. And we can time all the events directly to the time point when they really occur and not when we just have a look into the incubator or outside the incubator. Interesting for me is if we start, for example, with dynamic morphology, all the topics which you see here, these are all topics which are proven by literature over the last, let's say, 20 to 30 years by embryologists to be relevant. And all this was done in the time lapse before, in the era before time lapse. Now we have time lapse, and now all of a sudden we cannot only look on morphology, but we can look on every of these topics over time. And we see that time really plays an important factor in the whole business. Time is allowing us to see all these changes continuously as they, as they evaluate, as they happen. And we also can see that sometimes we are misleading by having not been the proper time point when we look at. If you see something like that and actually look Two hours earlier, it was a plasticist. If you see this in the morning on day five, you doubt maybe what to do with it. Probably wait to day six, but not making a decision right now. So we know that these dynamic changes occur, and we only know it since we have time lapse. Here's a picture which was intentionally taken on the left side 
around the time of 42 hours. That is actually the time where usually, if you follow the Alpha Istanbul Asher, uh, consensus paper, this is the time where you actually normally look at it. And you can see this embryo just is in the cleavage event. And during cleavage events, morphology line sometimes looks really odd. But if you look on the same embryo a couple of hours later, it looks completely different. So especially if you have to stick to certain timings, we really may not get the whole picture. Multinucleation. I was in the morning in a session where actually half of the talks were about multinucleation. It's fascinating. And all of these talks were using time lapse in order to discuss this issue of multinucleation. And everybody, I think, acknowledged that without having time lapse, we are not able at all to talk any ways about how multinucleation is performing, how the embryos develop, and so on. So we need this tool. Why do we need it? We know from a basic embryology that multinucleation is not a good thing. We know that already. But now we can study it. And it's amazing that if you only use standard observation, you can overlook, depending on the literature used, between 23 to 73 percent of the incidence. That's amazing. If you accept that there is a clinical impact of that, this is really a dramatic figure, I would say. Looking at this paper here, which was published from a Turkish group, where they actually looked on multinucleation on the two-cell stage. By avoiding multinucleated embryos, they got a very clear benefit in terms of implantation rate and in terms of clinical pregnancy rate. And in their paper, they clearly show that if they would have not have had time lapse, they would have overlooked actually quite a large proportion of that. This is on the fossil stage. This is the evaluation of a huge database where every embryo is known what happens to the embryo. And what you can see from this huge database is that if you have multinucleation at the fossil stage, no matter in how many blastomeres, one is already enough, you get a 25% lower implantation rate. And in 23% of the times, you would miss it if you would stick to those published timings which we have. Cleavage patterns, extremely interesting, because abnormal cleavage patterns is what we defined first time with time lapse. Now we have these wordings, we have direct cleavage. We never talked about that before because we never saw it, that embryos can cleave directly. And it could occur at different stages of development. And by that, you can get completely different patterns at the end. So you can end up with a blastocyst where maybe some of the cells are really derived from an abnormal cleavage event, or here only part of them are derived from an abnormal cleavage event. What does that tell us? What does it have to do with the embryo and the potential? We can now study it and we can look on it. This is just an example for this direct cleavage one to three, which seems to have a pretty high incidence, and you will not see it if you don't have your Thomas machine. You will overlook it. And you will miss it very often. And the other thing here on the left side, you just show it was a 2 to 5. From 2 cells directly to 5 cells. If you come in the morning and day 2, maybe you see a 5 cell, maybe you're happy. Oh, it's a fast one. And this really shows that this fast embryo probably is not a good choice if you would choose it later on. We know from data that these embryos have a high unoploidy rate and that they have either a low implantation rate, especially the 1 to 3, or if they implant the 2 to 5, they seem to have a higher miscarriage rate. And I guess data are coming there. This is another part of a kind of abnormal cleavage event, so called reverse cleavage. And there was just a publication beginning of this year clearly showing that embryos showing that have close to zero implantation rate. And it can be quite frequent occurring. And what happens simply is that one of the blastomeres tries to divide and then it divides and snaps back. And by that, you double the chromosome content of that one blastomere. And you will not be even able to see it by RACGH because it's the whole chromosome content which is duplicated and you cannot pick it up, definitely not. So we can correlate all these timings with, time, with, with, um, with the event. We can correlate it with the development. And then, of course, we can start to use it and to see where we can use this information to improve our way how we perform embryology. That has been done. There is a lot of publications now out. Different studies, retrospective studies, prospective studies, randomized control trials, and they all go more or less very often the same direction. We have an improved implantation rate. 
We have a reduced pregnancy loss rate, which is really now something coming up in several papers. And all together, this leads to a shorter time to pregnancy. And Steve will give you later on a very nice example how you can actually translate that into a financial calculation, which is very interesting, I would say, in our nowadays move of finance and medicine. With a randomized controlled trial, I guess most of you know it, it's from the EV group. It's the only randomized controlled trial which was aimed to see an improvement in implantation rate. And they see a higher ongoing pregnancy rate, they see a higher implantation rate, and they see a reduced early pregnancy loss. And if you calculate that together, again, it gives a shorter time to pregnancy. There's another randomized controlled trial. I'm not going into that because that was actually intermediate analysis in ASHRAE a couple of one or two years back. But you can see the results in a session which is on Wednesday afternoon. This is a slide I got from a group in Turkey, Memorial Hospital. What they actually looked at, they just used two variables, which is the time when the blastocyst formation starts and the time to the expansion of the blastocyst. And then actually they looked on the so-called life birth rate. So we are no longer talking about pregnancies or implantation. We are talking about children that are born. And if you then make a calculation where you can actually look on cutoff points, you clearly can see that embryos falling here, the crosses here, actually are those giving a life birth, and the round circles are those that gave no life birth. And you can see that if an embryo is in this sector here, having a very early formation of the blastocyst cavity and a very early expansion, they have nearly a double as high life birth rate than embryo sitting here. And there are certain embryos which you can exclude already at that point. Fascinating, I would say, because we are now really moving into a different field. Morphokinetics and algorithms. I guess this is what everybody attracts most in the beginning, but you all know from the papers that you need some data in order to be able to make these nice algorithms. EV has published one. It fits very well into the EV structure and in the EV settings. It may not fit to every other center. And it may take some time until you have all this data in order to be able to make such an algorithm. There is a solution. Actually, there is a solution called KITSCORE. What does KITSCORE mean? KIT means known implantation data, but it also means you get a chart. KIT. So it's a very clever name, I would say. KIT is actually a decision support tool. What does it mean? It means that you have very robust criteria which you can use in order to deselect embryos. And you can do that with only a couple of, let's say, very easy to annotate parameters. And on day three, you already have a clear distinction of your embryos. And you can see some that have a higher kid score category and others that are on a lower category. The difference between here to here is something like a seven-fold difference in implantation rate. And you simply can use that straight away. If you want to have a little bit more insight on that, there is a poster outside, poster 205, and you can see some nice evaluations how this compares, for example, to embryologists who use standard morphology assessment. Kid score also works, although it's a day three algorithm, it works for day five prediction. This is the kid score categories and let's say the blastocyst formation rate and also the blastocyst quality. And you can see that there is a huge difference between a kid score category one and five in terms of how many blastocysts develop and also how many top quality blastocysts you have within each category. Amazing knowing that on day three. So I'm coming back and give you a summary about that. So my summary is more or less that what maybe started as a dream, at least for me in the embryology lab, this has come true because I can use all this which is on the top. I can look on my continuously observation of my embryos. I can really see changes in morphology. I can see cleavage patterns. I can see morphokinetics. I can follow that and I can use this in order to deselect or select embryos. And by having that, I am more or less getting exactly that. I'm getting a better outcome in terms of reduced pregnancy loss, higher pregnancy rates, shorter time to pregnancy. And I think with that, I want to end. I'd like to thank you and give back to the chairman. <laughs>